implementing prompt and prompt fading strategies. I do want to go over a few announcements before we um, start really on this. So based on some feedback we got in the um, surveys that you guys fill out, we want to talk about West Campus attendance. So this is reported to us by the TAs, so we don't really have a lot of say over point deductions. If it's written, we do have to deduct the points no matter what it is. Um, but however, just be ready to work with your kid by your assigned time. Um, you shouldn't just be walking in at that time. That's what might be getting you late if you're a couple minutes late. Uh, and again, we do just have to take points away. Um, and then seminar attendance, we wanted to let you guys know there's been a lot of confusion about the surveys. So we gave you guys points back for any previously missed surveys. So you should see an increase in your seminar attendance grade if that was an issue. However, for the remaining two weeks, we're not gonna be excusing any of this in the future, but we're really sorry about any of the confusion and hopefully you guys will be cool with the grade slips this week, you guys. <laughs> Some of that. All right, cool. So, prompt and prompt fading. Everyone has guided notes. Cool. So, to start, we're going to be talking about response prompts. And I guess to preface this entire PowerPoint, you guys have a supplemental that's due this uh, this weekend, and it is covering stimulus control transfer procedures, which are all about prompt fading. So, it does. There's a little bit of redundancy in the two PowerPoints but you guys will just be really fluent in everything um, that's covered. So I'm really sorry, please don't roast us. <laughs> so response prompts, they're gonna be operating directly on a response. Um, it's kind of like a supplemental stimulus, it's like an SD if you wanna think of it that way. It's cueing the response. Um, and there's three major forms that's gonna do this. So we have verbal instructions, modeling, and physical guidance. And we're gonna cover each of these throughout the slides. So first is those verbal instructions. So there's two types of verbal instructions. There's vocal verbal. So this is what you're orally saying. You're telling the student what to do. So an example, if you hold up a picture of a cat and you say, this is a cat, say cat, that's a vocal verbal instruction. And then there's also non-vocal verbal. Um, so these can be written words, manual signs, pictures, etc., that are instructing the student what to do. Uh, if you think of the bathroom, we have those task analyses by the uh, sinks. Those are non-vocal verbal instructions. So they're pictures telling the student that you can cue to tell the student what to do. So a little example, we've got vocal verbal prompt. The kiddo here is crying, um, trying to get to the book, which is the reinforcer. She'll provide the vocal instruction of book. The kid says book and gets the book. So with prompts, what do you want to do as soon as you insert a prompt with a client? What should you always be thinking about? Do you want them to be using that prompt their whole life? No, so your first thought as a behavior analyst or as a technician that's implementing it is how you're gonna fade that prompt. So with vocal verbal prompts, what do you guys think you could do to fade that prompt? so that they're not depending on it or relying on it. Yeah, Allison? Maybe like presenting the book and waiting for them to respond and then also to provide the verbal prompt. Perfect, so we'll go over that much later in the PowerPoint, but that's called a time delay, so that's a definitely one way. Um, with vocal verbal prompts, it's a little hard to fade that um, in the sense of like just shortening the word. So here I do have an example where um, the tech will say buh instead of book, and that's a vocal verbal prompt that is slightly faded for the client to say book and get it back. But yeah, a time delay is another really great example where I can hold the book and instead of immediately saying book, I'm gonna wait three seconds. So it's providing them an opportunity to it, it, respond. And then you can systematically increase that uh, response. Thank you. Go ahead, I got this one. All right, so um, there are a few videos because I couldn't find really great video, or we couldn't create videos for this yet. Yeah. Um, what one of my kids like? I was trying to do that where if it was that book example, like whenever I would say like book, like she would just repeat book. She wouldn't like say book. How would you go about like teaching them to say the whole word, not just like echoing what I'm saying? Um, it sounds like she probably isn't ready for a prompt like that. Okay. 
and you would probably have to use something like a time delay. Okay. She's just engaging in the response that's been reinforced in the past. So every time you make a sound, she repeats it, she gets an edible, kind of like that. Okay. Um, so, or just in giving her more opportunities where she would have to contact that reinforcement for that. So she says, buh, or you say buh, she says book, who gets a reinforcer. Okay. Just kind of hard to um, get that under your Samuel's control and get her into contact with that uh, contingency, if that makes sense? Yeah. All right, so let's watch this video. This is a non-vocal um, verbal prompt. So she's not really speaking, but it's a vocal prompt that's being used, or non-vocal verbal. This next example shows an instructor reducing the amount of a visual prompt when teaching a student her phone number. Morgan, practice your phone number. What's your phone number? 310-555-2245. Very cool, high five. Each time the student responds correctly with prompts, then the instructor takes away one number until the student can say her phone number without any of the visual prompts. Um, 
the example that we're going to look at is used more for kids that have rule governed behavior, can understand the rules and instructions that are given. Normally what we would do with video modeling, if you guys have ever used it at West Campus, it's basically just a video of someone doing the exact behavior. It's not going to be as complex as the video I'm going to show you, but if you ever work with um, some older clients, this is something you might use or see. It's kind of cute. This video shows how we can ask our friends to play. Here are the steps to remember when asking friends to play. First, think about what game or activity you may want to play. Next, walk towards the friend you want to play with. Use your friend's name to gain their attention. Gently tap them on the shoulder. Finally, ask your friend if they'd like to play. So this is what they would be showing the clients, and they're going to listen Here to all these instructions. Here are some good examples of how we ask our friends to play. Mrs. Yanni on her shoulder to gain her attention. Mrs. Yanni, can you play with me? I sure can. Finally, watch as Alexis asks Cora to play. our students. All right, so again, that's a pretty complex video model um, that was used with those kids um, and other kids in that classroom to teach them how to initiate uh, playing games. But with our kids, it's more likely that you're going to video model or do a video model of a simple, small component response. All right, so there are some guidelines for modeling. So these are going to make your model more successful. So if the model's similarity, or I'm sorry, the model similarity with the client will make it more successful. So if they are similar in age, past experience, sex, gender, or physical appearance. So um, the example that the book gave for past experience was that if imitation is used to teach a teenager how to reduce drug abuse, a person who has successfully gone through that themselves might serve as a more effective model than someone who is not. In general, what that is talking about is generalization. So if the client can generalize more between themselves and the model, it's more likely to be successful. Um, prestige, so a model with prestige or social status can increase the likelihood of imitative behaviors. So going to like a basketball example, if you're gonna show them a video of LeBron James shooting a free throw, it's much more likely that they'll engage in a correct response than if you show them me shooting a free throw. 
Um, and then you should always have an emphasis on the critical aspect of behavior. So emphasizing or stressing important parts of it. So for example, I taught a client um, last semester to say the word skittle, but she was always saying tittle, and it kind of sounded like tickle, so we couldn't really tell the difference between the two. So when we gave her an echoic model, we would just really go skittle, and she eventually would start saying skittle. So just emphasizing the important or criti critical aspect. So continuing with that, as the video model that you watched um, showed, you can combine instructions with the model to increase the effectiveness. So it's providing that rationale and that reasoning and can help them kind of give themselves rule statements. Again, you're probably gonna use that only with clients who have that rule governed behavior. Probably wouldn't use it with clients in our classroom. Um, context, so having the model perform the behavior in a real situation. If you show them a video of someone handing over money and getting food, it's not as likely to generalize if you show them someone actually paying at a cash register to get a snack. Um, and then rehearsal and feedback. So we all know the more times that you have to try and learn, um, the more opportunities you have, the more likely you are to engage in the correct response. And also providing feedback on correct responses, incorrect responses, all the different components will help make your model more successful. Um, all right, I wanted to go over some examples that were given in Cooper Heron and Heward of different applications that you can use, so different modeling and formats, and also just different the wide range of behaviors that you can use video modeling or just modeling in general with. So this first article was using um, a live peer vocal model to teach a client to read sight words. So they would have um, a kid similar in age read the sight word and then the child that they were working with would imitate or echo that response. Um, so teaching first aid skills, so treating cuts, they used a live model with practice and feedback. So they would have someone show them the response, have the client practice it, and give them feedback on what they did right and wrong. Um, some daily living skills, so cooking, setting the table, folding jeans, cleaning. They used a point of view video model, which is pretty cool. So they probably had like a GoPro or some sort of camera so they could see exactly what they were doing and how it would look to themselves. And then the last one, sounds like it was for a job. So they were teaching a client how to wear the costume, the Rocky the Raccoon costume and greeting customers at the retail warehouse. So they provided not only scripted models, but also naturalistic settings. So they showed them, when you go up to a client, you should say, hello, I'm Rocky. And then also showed them somebody in the costume doing exactly that. So pretty cool, R wide variety of things that you can use modeling for um, and different ways that you can implement it. All right, next we're gonna be talking about physical guidance. So this is applied most often with young children, so the kids that we work with, um, learners with severe disabilities, and older adults experiencing physical limitations. So you're either gonna partially guide the student's movements or physically guide the student through the entire movement of a response. And again, this is what we most likely are using at West Campus because we have learners um, with not a broad range of skills and they're pretty young. And then I wanted to cover some pros and cons of physical guidance. So some cons, um, physical guidance is a lot more intrusive than verbal or model prompts. So you're hand over hand doing things for them. So with a model prompt, you're not touching them at all. They can engage in the response themselves. They're independently doing it. Um, and same with a verbal response. So physical guidance is just a lot more intrusive. So if you can use a different prompt, you should. And it makes precise assessment of student progress difficult because of the direct contact. So if you've ever done a hand over hand physical prompt, it's kind of hard to tell if your client's somewhat engaging in the response, if they could actually do the whole thing. I know even today when I was prompting JP, I'm like, I think he's sitting here doing the clapping, but I'm doing a whole physical prompt, so I can't really tell. So I don't know how much progress he's making with that prompt. And then it's also really hard to use if your learners resist physical touch. So do any of you guys work with a kid that doesn't like being touched at all? Yeah, quite a few of you. Um, so it's really hard to use physical prompting if that is, or if they fall in that category. However, there are some pros. So physical prompting is really effective. So you're engaging, you're prompting the client so that they're engaging in the correct response. They're gonna come in contact with reinforcement because of it. And it can be pretty easily baited, especially compared to a verbal prompt. Um, you have the, 
steps that you can fade it back, which makes it a lot easier to fade than a verbal prompt. All right, now like, we can move on to stimulus prompts. So the first one is movement. So this type of stimulus prompt involves pointing to, touching, tapping, or looking at the correct stimulus. I think we refer to this as a gestural prompt. So you're just gonna kind of give them the correct answer. There's also a position prompt. So if you're thinking of maybe like a receptive ID task, you would place the correct stimulus a little closer to them. Or let's say they're right side biased, you might place it on the right side, um, just so that they're going to engage in the right response. And then there's redundancy. So this one sounds a little funny, but one or more stimulus or response dimension is gonna be paired with the correct choice. So it's kind of just making it very obvious what the right answer is. So if you guys, you guys all took 1400, so on the homework sheets, we would bold the right answer. It's kind of just like, hello, this is the answer here. So you can put a star on the right answer. And I think Kaylee put some examples of this in um, the PowerPoint for this weekend. So I don't really want to go over this a ton, but do you guys understand kind of the differences between all of these? So stimulus prompts, there's the three types, um, and just make sure you know all the differences between the three. So I will go over an example. So movement, again, it's just that gesture prompt, so I'm gonna, point to it, say fish, and I'll point to it, and then the client will select the fish. Then there is a position prompt. So similar, um, this is that receptive identification task where I'm trying to get him to identify the object that I'm labeling. So I'll say circle, and the circle is gonna be placed closest to him. So how do you guys think you could fade this response, or fade the stimulus? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really yeah, super simple. The next phase, you'd probably have it right there. And then the next phase, you'd probably have it right there um, until the clients can do it with it in the normal array. Cool. And then that redundancy. So this is actually something, this is screenshots of um, a procedure I actually did with one of my clients at West Campus. So the procedure was um, for her to color where I was pointing. So when it started, all the circles were that little tiny circle and I would hand her the pen and she would just scribble the whole thing. So she was not getting it at all. So we used redundancy to kind of emphasize, I want you to color right here. So this was the very first phase where I would say color here, hand her the pen, prompt it if necessary. And then the next phase, I made it a little tiny bit smaller. I would say color here and continuing, I would say color here and slowly just continued fading that until they were all the same size and I would say color here, and she would do it like she was supposed to on the first phase. So it was pretty cool, and it worked really, really well, and we could switch up um, the position of it, so I would point to the one in the corner, the one over there, and she was actually attending to where I was pointing. So that was really awesome. Okay, prompt fading. So again, Kaylee covers this pretty in depth on the PowerPoint that she goes over um, for this weekend. So I'll just kind of breeze over these so that it's not super redundant. So there's most to least prompts. So this is systematically reducing the intrusiveness of the prompt, usually also referred to as errorless teaching. So you're starting with the most intrusive prompt and once they can successfully um, not resist the prompt essentially, they'll fade that back. Uh, there's graduated guidance. So this is kind of weird to think about it, but it's like an in the moment prompt fading so you kind of like hover over the client and just don't allow them to engage in an incorrect response. So you prompt once they're about to mark, like make an incorrect response. It's kind of weird. Have any of you guys ever ran or done graduated guidance? Maybe. It's not that um, common in our classroom, but again, like let's say if I say circle and they start to go for square, that's when I would prompt them. So it's not a set, you're doing a full physical prompt this time. It's just in the moment, you prompt as needed. All right, least to most prompt. This is basically our classroom procedure. Um, it's what we do with almost every procedure, procedure. So it's allowing the child to engage in a correct response and come into contact with that contingency. And then you move up the prompt hierarchy as needed. So if they get the response incorrect, that's when you would move up the prompt hierarchy um, and just always allow them to engage in the response independently. Um, there's also a time delay. So this is increasing the delay between the SD and the prompt. Um, I'm doing one right now where we immediately on the first phase did a full physical prompt. 
and then once he didn't resist the prompt, we moved it back to three seconds. So I count one, two, three after I give the SD, so I'd say quiet hands. If he didn't engage in the response, then I would provide the prompt. And then you systematically increase that response, uh, or increase that delay. So it's kind of um, just hoping that they'll, not hoping, but um, giving them a chance to engage in the correct response. Um, and the more that you increase the time delay, um, it's kind of making it more aversive, essentially, because if they engage in the right response, they get the reinforcer quicker, whereas they could just sit there and wait out the whole time delay, but it's going to cause them to have to wait longer to get the reinforcer. And then stimulus fading. So there's a variety of ways that you can do this. I showed you the example with the circles, but you can fade the color of a stimulus, fade the size, fade the position, um, et cetera. Lots of different um, examples. All right, so now we're gonna do a whiteboard think pair share. So I think you guys are done with your notes, right? All right, so we're gonna go over some examples and I'm gonna let you guys kind of figure out what prompt you should use. Oh my gosh, these are heavy. So if you guys wanna pass forward your get it notes, you can do that. Sure. What do you need? Okay. Is everyone else good? Okay. Do you guys need? Oh. Okay. It's like making its way. Can you hurry up, please? No, I'm good. Right, so per customer feedback survey, we're not going to do a Kahoot today. What? So we're going to do more of an activity based. So I've created some like case studies where I'm going to allow you guys a chance to think. I'll keep the thinking short, and then you'll pair, and then we'll do a whiteboard share. Um, so, what this is, is you guys are gonna read through the case study, and just tell me what kind of prompting method you think you should use with this client. Everyone good? So, remember we think first, so I'll give you guys a second to kind of read it over, think about it. I mean, I guess I could read it out loud too. Um, so your client has whistleblown, that means they've got zeros on in percentages on matching, so they can't do matching um, objects. She was able to match an icon to an object, so that's like a picture of a car to the actual car, and could also match the object to the icon. So she could take the car and match it to the icon of the car. Um, she resists physical prompts, but it has a very strong imitative repertoire. So that means she can probably do physical, motor, gross motor, fine motor, all that stuff. So what prompt would you use to teach matching objects? So kind of think about it, the options we have here, you can do verbal prompting, modeling, physical prompting, and then also those stimulus prompts. So there's the different kinds of stimulus prompts that you guys can talk about. So think about it, think what would be the most beneficial, and then I'll let you guys pair. Yeah. Okay, are you guys ready to pay? 
here. Okay, pair up and kind of talk about why you thought your prompting method would be the most effective. have a car and a car, um, you would match the car for them and then hand it to them again. Okay, and now think about it. What do we want to do anytime we put a prompt in? Fade it. So how would you fade a model prompt like this? Denny? Okay, so kind of fading back to a gesture prompt. Okay. What other way could you fade a model prompt? You guys can share.
See your guys' responses. Okay, you guys are. Do we want to use verbal prompts in the bathroom? Uh, no. 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 What should be controlling the response in the bathroom? What should control a response 
in a task analysis, or I'm sorry, in a change response. Yeah, the previous link in the chain, so it should be like the dirty hands are controlling my response, not wash hands, get soap, get this, Wait, get this. Then what's a, what would a task analysis be? You could do like a picture prompt. But isn't that so what verbal? would that be? Wouldn't that be a non-vocal verbal? Non-vocal verbal. Be more specific. Read my mind, guys. <laughs> Okay, I guess you're right. Okay, okay. So, what are the types of verbal prompts you would use then? Okay. So, give me an example. Okay, so picture prompts. What's another one you could use? I saw, did you have it? Yeah, you could use peer modeling. So, it says that they won't imitate the technician, but they'll imitate their peers. So, if you have a peer who can engage in that response, you could videotape them, or you could just have the peer come and help prompt them. Yeah, Nikki? What would be, like, like sometimes with Trey, I just have to, like, tap the side of his pants and then he'll do the rest of it. Is that considered verbal then, too? Like, that was so that was, um, I believe, one of the stimulus prompts. So your movement, your gesturing, tapping to, pointing to the correct stimulus. Okay. Wouldn't that be a physical? Sorry. Physical is you're moving their body. So you're partially prompting them or fully prompting them. So is it gestural prompts like Selena's prompts? Yes. Don't get too caught up in the difference between those. <laughs> it's not super important. For the prompting hierarchy, they include different types of prompts within it. So it could be like, we start with that gestural, we'll do a model, then we'll do a partial physical, then a full physical. So it's not all within that same kind of response prompt or partial physical prompt. Does that make sense? So don't get, get too caught up in that. But I apologize, your answer of verbal prompt was correct. Non-vocal verbal, good job. All right, I think this is the last one. So your client whistle blew, so again, that means they didn't get it correct so many days in a row that they got like straight zeros or whatever. Um, on the classroom procedure of teaching receptive ID. So that's when you say dog and they have to point to the picture of the dog. So the classroom procedure is always at least to most prompting but they didn't resist any of your, your prompts. So the client can tact different colors and has a strong imitative and echoic repertoire. So what prompts would you use to teach receptive ID? Contingencies here. Um, you could use most to least prompting, 
but those physical prompts are more restrictive. So if you could do some sort of stimulus prompt where you're not having to physically prompt them, that's a lot better than doing the most to least um, that is a lot more restrictive. Cool, you guys did really well with that. All right, um, we're gonna watch a recap video. This is about like 14 minutes long. It is a little slower. I know it's um, sometimes a little redundant to have to watch these, but it, since we're not doing a Kahoot, it does just kind of summarize everything really nicely and go over everything that we covered today. All right. And then we're gonna do an activity. So if you guys want to, you're done with the whiteboards, you can set those on the ground or pass them forward or whatever. Um, but I'll let you guys watch this. intervention training video series. In this video, we will define and give some examples of different types of prompts. We will define prompt hierarchies and explain how to use them. We will also discuss the importance of systematically removing prompts. Let's begin by defining what a prompt is. Prompts are stimuli presented to ensure the occurrence of a response. In other words, prompts are cues that an instructor can use to make sure a child succeeds at a task. For example, when teaching a child to do a puzzle or put together Mr. Potato Head, the therapist can tap the correct space with the finger. This prompts the child to place the piece in the correct place. When teaching a child to brush his teeth, the therapist might physically guide the child's hands through the motions. This ensures that the child performs the correct actions. Brush the variety of prompts is almost endless. We will discuss the ones used most frequently. Let's begin with physical prompts. With physical prompts, the therapist physically moves the child to make the correct response. One common physical prompt is a hand-over-hand -hand prompt. With hand-over-hand -hand prompting, a therapist holds the child's hand and guides the child towards the correct response. For example, the therapist could guide the child's hand to show him how to put a lace through the correct hole or how to print a letter. Let's watch an example of a therapist using physical prompts. Another way to prompt a child is to model the correct response. With modeling, the therapist acts out the response. This ensures that the child observes the response being done correctly. For example, when teaching a child to play feed a doll, you could model feeding a bottle to the doll before asking the child to feed a bottle to the doll. Note in this example, the therapist also used some physical prompts. Here is an example of a therapist using a modeling prompt with block building. Can you make a chain? Yeah. Okay, it's not the ball in my dream. another type of prompt. Gestures include pointing towards, looking at, or otherwise gesturing to indicate a correct response. For example, when asking a child to touch the yellow card, you could tap the correct card. Touch yellow. child a clue about the correct response. For example, you might hold up a picture of a question mark to prompt the child to ask you a question. There's bubbles in your mouth. Note the therapist held the picture of the question 
question mark toward the camera so we could see it, but she would not normally present it in such an awkward manner. <laughs> Positional prompts involve positioning the teaching material in a way that increases the chances that the child will respond correctly. For example, you could place the cue card with the correct response closer to the child than any of the other cards. Children, give me all the animals. In this example, the therapist placed all the animals close to the child and all the other pictures on her side of the table. Last, verbal prompts refer to any vocal cues you may give to the child. There are many different types of verbal prompts. For example, you could use a direct echo prompt. While playing, you might say the words you want the child to say. Or when using questions, you might ask the child a question and then immediately say the correct answer. The child echoes you to get the correct answer. Here are some examples. skills, you need to remove the prompts by moving down the prompt hierarchy. If not removed quickly, the child can become dependent on the prompt. Using the prompt hierarchy as a guide for removing prompts helps teach children to be able to succeed independently. The technical term for this process of moving down the prompt hierarchy and removing prompts is prompt fading. Let's watch a therapist demonstrate Touch prompt cheese. fading. Ooh, wow! Touch cheeks. Ooh, whoa, 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 whoa! Touch cheeks. Ooh, love it. Play. 
trial, the therapist held her hands at the ready, but no longer used the hand-over-hand -hand prompt. There are two ways to fade prompts using the prompt hierarchy. The first way is to fade the intensity of the prompt within a level of the prompt hierarchy. The second way is to test or probe the child's competence at the next lower level of the prompt hierarchy. With both methods, the goal is to fade prompts as quickly as possible while ensuring maximum success. It would be great if children could be prompted with such accuracy and precision that they never gave an incorrect response. Of course, this goal is unattainable. However, we can try to minimize errors by fading prompts only when we think the child can succeed with a lower intensity or lower level prompt. To fade the intensity of a prompt within a level of the prompt hierarchy, we make it less and less noticeable. For example, when using hand-over-hand -hand prompts, you can start to apply less pressure, gradually allowing the child to move his or her hand independently. You can fade a point prompt in a similar manner by gradually gesturing in smaller and less noticeable ways. Or you could fade a verbal prompt by giving less and less verbal instructions or by only saying the first syllable of a correct response rather than the whole word. Once you have faded the intensity of a prompt, and you believe that the child can succeed at the next level in the prompt hierarchy, you can probe the child's readiness. You do this by moving down one prompt level in your hierarchy and determining if the child is successful. If the child succeeds, you can stay at that lower level prompt and begin fading towards the next lower level in your hierarchy. If the child does not succeed, you go back up to the previous level of prompt where the child was successful and work towards fading the intensity again. First, we will watch an example of a therapist successfully probing a lower level prompt. Then, we will watch an example of a therapist probing a lower level prompt where the child fails and the therapist moves back up to the higher level of prompt. Look, I made steps. I made steps. Can you make steps too? As we reach the end of this video, we must emphasize that fading prompts is one of the most important things you need to remember. It would be pointless to teach children to do things that they could only ever do if they were prompted. Therefore, from the very moment you begin using prompts, you should be thinking about how best to remove them. kind of identify what you should be doing with your clients. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, if you'll just take my
sure about what you would do with? Or all expert behavior? Just, just 
scattering. One, two, three, four. Take one out, Justin.